Earlier this week, when I was contacting some of my colleagues about how to introduce our guests, um, I wrote to a journalist who has covered Congo, and I asked him about Dennis McQuaige, and he responded very concisely um, that he is the closest you will ever get to meeting a living saint. <laughs> Dr. McQuaige has devoted his adult life to treating the wounds of women who have been raped. The number of patients traumatized patients who he has treated is, I think, over 50,000. He is the world's leading authority on treating sexual violence in war, and in 2008, he was honored with the Nobel Peace Prize to the surprise of absolutely no one. But my favorite story about him is that in 2012, when he and his family were forced to flee his country for their own security, it was ordinary women who raised money to buy him a return ticket so that he could continue treating them, and he got on that plane. He will be joined in conversation with another guest who certainly needs no introduction from a middle-aged newspaper reporter. Emma Watson was a acclaimed and powerful person when she was still a little girl. Um, and what's happened since then um, is maybe even more unusual, which is that she has shown how it is possible to cross over into womanhood without turning down the volume on your opinions. Without worrying about who you will please or displease when you say what you think. She is unapologetically herself and unapologetically feminist. And I can say, as the mother of two young daughters, that she is bringing a lot of people with her. Emma um, supports more than 30 organizations in the equality and women's rights movement. She is a goodwill ambassador for UN Women. And along with Dr. McQuaige, she sits on the G7 Gender Advisory Council. We all woke up today to the news that Alabama has all but outlawed abortion in that state, which is a reminder, I think, to all of us that this is not a struggle that was fought and won in someone else's lifetime. The New York Times is delighted to host this event with How To Academy, which brings global thinkers to London to share new ideas. There are two events coming up that you should keep an eye out for. One of them is David Brooks, our own columnist, who will appear, I think, on Monday to talk about how to find a purpose, something I would like to do. Um, <laughs> and later on, something I'm quite excited about, Caitlin Moran and Jess Phillips on how to change your life. Um, as I understand it, these two extraordinary people have known each other for a while, um, and we are all just lucky to be able to eavesdrop on them tonight. So without further ado, Dennis McQuaige and Emma Watson. Hello, Denny. Hello, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> you have a bit of an audience here. Um, it's been such a pleasure to spend so much time with you um, in the last seven days. Um, I hope you don't mind, but I'd like to begin right at uh, the kind of point when your work started, which was 1996, the first Congo War. Uh, what started the conflict? What were some of the long-standing, underlying issues that contributed? Yeah. In 1996, um, it was just uh, after the genocide in Rwanda 
So me, uh, millions of refugees, Hutus refugees, uh, fled to Congo. And they created some camps just at the border of Rwanda and Congo. And this lasts for two years. But after two years, uh, Rwanda decided to destroy all these camps. And at this moment, uh, really, we thought that it was just for to destroy the camp. But uh, something terrible happened at this moment. So um, I was a medical doctor at Lemera Hospital. And uh, doing my job as a medical doctor. But um, on the night of the 6th of October, the hospital was attacked and 30, more than 30 people were killed, including my patients and uh, some of my staff. And I can say that my life really changed since this moment. It was less than a year after the first Congo War uh, ended that the second Congo War uh, began. And this time you were uh, forced to leave and um, you, you left where you were working in uh, Lemura and you went back to your home city of um, Bukavu. And uh, it was here that where you first started Pansy Hospital. Uh, can you tell me a bit more about this, this part of your story? <clears throat> yeah, in, two, uh, in 1998, the Second War started. And this was just because uh, when the war started in 1996, um, it was with the IFDL, uh, it was a group army led by Desiree Kabila, and he was backed by Rwanda with a military from Rwanda. So after two years, he asked uh, all these militaries to go back in, in Rwanda. And uh, it was maybe they didn't really accept it because uh, two weeks after, they created a new, a new army group who is called RCD, and they attack again um, the, the Congo. So at this moment, I went to Bukavu. Bukavu is, my, is the city where, where I born. And my big, uh, I was so touched to see that uh, Lemera was in the rural area. And there really, the maternal mortality was very high. I can say that even more than 10 women were dying for 1,000 delivery. And this is very high. So um, in this situation, I just decided that uh, when I went in Bukavu, I saw that the situation was the same. I was thinking that maybe in the town, women have more obstetrical care. But um, it was, I was wrong. And I just saw that it was the same situation. So I decided to create just a small hospital where I can perform cesarean and help women to fight against maternal mortality. That was my goal, but uh, unfortunately, the first patient I treated at Panzi in Bukavu area, she didn't come for uh, the childbirth, but she came because she was raped with extreme violence. And this was a terrible thing. It was, for me, the first time to see a woman rape, but after to be raped, to get all the genitals destroyed by shooting in the genital. And really, I just get the impression that uh, what uh, I saw at this moment, I, I think that it should be a crazy man who just did it because he was maybe under, under drug or things like that. But I was completely wrong because three months after, I treat more, I treat 45 women with the same stories and women who will really rape with extreme violence to be shot in genital, to introduce objects in their genital, to burn the genital. And really, for me, it was, I, I, I can say that for my experience as an obstetrician, it was the first time to see all these terrible things. 
And after three months, I start to understand that there is really a new things who are happening in my region. Rape with extreme violence was a new pathology. Wow. Um, and gosh, first I just have to say, how do you emotionally deal with the it dawning on you that perhaps these injuries were not the work of one single mad man, but you were seeing men, boys, grandmothers, babies, even sometimes, that were coming to you with these kinds of injuries. How, how did you deal emotionally with it dawning on you that this was someone had thought about this, someone had calculated this, someone was using this as an intended tactic of war? Yeah, uh, at the beginning, really, I was, um, I took my time to talk with victims and discuss with them. It was not only because I would like to know what happened, but uh, most of the time, even for victims, it was very important to get someone who can listen to them, who can support them, and you can't support if you don't listen to what they're telling you. So at the beginning, really, I start to, to to support them and to listen at this time in the hospital. <clears throat> uh, we were working with that psychologist, so I was only the one uh, to receive them, talk with them, support them emotionally. But uh, at the end, I just feel that uh, myself, I was impacted by what, uh, what was happening in, on the body of women. And it's become very hard for me to go on doing my job because an operation that I could do maybe in two hours after to listen, to be so close of victims, I start to be impact myself. And the operations that I could do in two hours, sometimes could do, even take more time because I would like to be perfect. I would like really to answer to the, the, their expectation and you know, when you have a girl of 12, 14 years uh, and who asks you uh, what will be my future, um, can I get the possibility to be continent again when the, the heads are losing faces or urine? And all this kind of question uh, to ask you if uh, they will get, be able to get um, marriage it was very hard for me. And when you are making operation in this condition, you are trying to get a good result, as good as you can. And it's just taking a long time. And I just feel, I felt uh, at this moment, just I feel that I was really impacted by what was happening in, in the hospital. And not only in the hospital, even for my daughters. I have four daughters. And I start to feel that uh, my relation with, with my, my daughters was really very, a little bit changed because I was so afraid if something happened to them and uh, to start to do even the nightmare with all this situation. So at this moment, I really think that I should not go on talking with victim and know exactly what happened. I changed my way to see things. Even my emotion was there, but I just tried to do only surgery so I can be more effective in doing surgery in spite to, to do also the psychology. It's amazing to me, though, that considering, I mean, I've read that at times you'll perform up to 10 surgeries in a day, that when and when there's so many patients that need to be seen that you felt that the value of your time to sit and listen to someone was something really important that you could offer. Um, that, that feels really impactful to me. Um, I read that you really pioneered this new approach, this holistic approach that doesn't just treat that, that kind of acknowledges that you can't just treat <laughs> a survivor's physical um, symptoms. You, you have to 
provide for their, the emotional trauma, you, financial aid, legal help if they need it. Um, there's so many other angles to, to look at. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about, I read a lot about that. Yeah, uh, of course, we didn't really start to do the models that we are doing now in one time. As, as uh, I said, when I start to, to treat patient uh, of uh, victim of sexual violence, it was really the medical side. But slowly, I discover that <clears throat> when women are raped in this, in this situation, when rape is used as a weapon of war, is not only to destroy them physically, but is also to destroy them mentally. And most of the time, rape is happening in public, in front of the husband, the children, rape in front of their parents, and uh, uh, women are raped in front of their husband, and so on. So the consequence is not only physical consequence, but is also mental consequence. And after a few months, we start to understand that even if we uh, succeed with uh, uh, physical healing, but the big question was the mentally, and women will not like really to leave the hospital, and they were coming with other questions, and at the end we discover that it was a kind of somatization of their pain, and uh, the only one way was to support them psychologically. So we create the second pillar of our uh, the holistic care is uh, uh, psychological support. And now we have psychologists, we have also uh, social assistant and uh, psychosocial assistant who are supporting women before the surgery and after the surgery, but also they are supporting them to do the family mediation because this is really needed. Most of the women are rejected after to be raped, they are rejected by the family, the community. And, and it's very important for them uh, from to treat their emotion also is to reintegrate them in, the, in their community. The third pillar just come because when women are rejected, they don't have families, they are alone. How you can send them back in their village if you don't give them a support so they can be um, autonomous in, in, their, in their village? So we create the third pillar with the socioeconomical support. And there, when uh, girls are very young, we have a program to send them to school. And uh, we have more than uh, 5,000 girls in all levels we are supporting to go to school because this is very important uh, for girls when they are rejected by the family because they have a child born after rape and they, have, they don't have another possibility is really to send them to school. But when they can't go to school, we have many programs uh, to support them to be autonomous and this is the way to reintegrate them in the community, because when women are strong enough uh, economically, so they don't need really uh, other kind of reinsertion. And I was really very happy, maybe I, 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 can, I can just tell you what one time I treat women coming from somewhere where they have a lot of oil palm. And when they return back, we give them some product to, to make soap. And I was so impressed. After one month, this women sent me some soap and they said, Dr. Mukwege, we want you to wash your hands with this soap. And each time when you wash your hands with, this star, with soap when you are treating patients, think about us. When we come in the hospital, our name was raped women. But today, you are... Uh, uh, soap makers in our village. And everyone is treating us with respect because now if they want to buy soap, we are doing the best soap in the village. And our, our future completely changed with this program. And you can see that sometimes to insert people in their community is just to give women the capacity to be autonomous. The last pillar is the legal assistant. And this is very important because when women are physically they are good, 
mentally they are enough strong, economically, the children can go to school, they can eat uh, without problem, and maybe they have a small shelter. The last thing is dignity. And for the dignity, most of the time women are coming back at the hospital to ask us how we can support them to go to justice. So at the hospital now we have a program with seven lawyers who can make the files for victims and accompany them uh, to the court. And this is really something where I think that we need to do more because the government is not helping us uh, enough to support women to recover and restore their dignity. And the justice can help also to do reparation because for most of the women we are treating, they need this reparation. They need that the society, the community can accept that we didn't protect them uh, enough. They need just to, under that, to understand that the community recognize that they should be protected as human, and they, they didn't. So this recognition and reparation is really the steps that we are fighting for, and women deserve it because I think that they need to be protected, and it didn't happen. Yes. <laughs> Um, this was a question I was going to ask you later, but perhaps I'll ask it now in connection to what you just said. You recently um, worked on some language. You worked on a UN resolution with Nadia Murad, with whom you share the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and the resolution was almost scrapped entirely, but the language got watered down a lot by the USA. And I'm just curious how... <sighs> How did you feel about that? How do you feel about our ability to continue to move forward and, and form broad coalitions when um, domestic politics <laughs> often will kind of interfere, interfere with that? Yeah, I think that this really was, uh, I can say, a terrible moment for, for me and Nadia because uh, to be at the UN and just to see that Russia, China, and America can come together to veto a resolution fighting for the right of women and especially the right of um, reproductive care health. I think that this was really terrible, especially for me as an obstetrician and gynecologist. How can you uh, just think that one moment that in taking care of victim of sexual violence, you have not to talk about reproductive health care. And this really was a terrible thing, but I, I think we need, we need to be a little bit more positive uh, about this resolution. <laughs> yeah, because we really, I, I think that what happened is um, in this resolution, it's the first time that we talked about children born after rape. And you can't imagine how this question is very hard, not only for our community, but it's also a hard question for victims of sexual violence. Because to get children without identity, to get children without any affiliation in the community, is very dangerous because it's like you have children, you don't want to give them identity. So they are very dangerous for the community. But also what I saw for women when they have children born after rape, it's like every time when this child can do something bad, all the symptoms come back again. So we need really to find how we can protect these children so they can be a problem for the victims. And for the first time, we talk about children born after rape. And I, I can say that this is a progress. We have really to, to take this progress. Can you imagine that with Yezidi women, for example, it's clear that the community said, 
we can accept women back, but we can't accept Muslim children back. And what it means? I, I can't believe that a child of two years, he decided to be Muslim. Maybe the father was Muslim, but the child, we have to give them a chance to choose what they want to be. Mm -hmm. But if the community just stigmatize them already and just put this stigma and say you are Muslim, you, we can't accept you in our community. It's terrible for the future. And in my community, we have thousands of thousands of children in this situation. They can't even take the name of the community because the community have the impression that the father of this, or these children are enemies of, of the community. So we need to deal with this question and find a good solution. Children have the right to be protected, whatever, how they can, but we have to protect them. And this is the first time. The second thing, we succeed to get an approach, an approach center, a survivor center approach in uh, the way to, to treat the victim of sexual violence. And this also is really, I can say that a progress in what we, we, we got la last time. The second thing, the third, is uh, the global fund mm. for reparation. Yes. And the last thing is, we talk about sanctions. And I can say that the big problem with sexual violence is impunity. You can see that in many cases, we are fighting a lot against impunity. But most of the time, we don't have enough tools to fight against impunity. If it's already very difficult for women in the peace time to get proofs when they are raped, how can you use the same laws in the war time and ask women to collect proofs for to go to justice? Yeah. And I think that this is really some questions that where we need a kind of innovation so women can feel that they can go to justice and don't be humiliated for the second time. Because the big question is when they come and you ask a woman, she came after six months to be raped, and you ask her to give proof of what happened. It's just, I think, that at the end, women will just stop to go to justice because they know that the first question will be prove what happened. And they can't give this proof because when uh, people are shooting, if someone shoot here, I think that everyone will try to protect himself and don't try to see who is shooting, why he's shooting, and shooting with what. And all this question, to ask women all this kind of question, yeah, after the war, is, is no sense. So I think that now we are trying to push on this question so we can be sure that women uh, in conflict, how we can help them to get justice. And I think that this is not nothing. It's really a progress. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just, I'm just blown away by your, well, yeah, in the face of everything that you do and you deal with and your positivity and the fact that you continue despite all sorts of things that we'll talk about in a minute, but just... Wow. Um, one of the things that, I, that just hearing you speak now and when I was reading, reading my notes that occurred to me is rape as a weapon of war would seem to me to be a form of terrorism. Is rape as a weapon of war ever considered in those terms as a, as a form of terrorism? Yeah, I think that uh, <clears throat> rape as a weapon of war can be used in a different way. And... Uh, um, it's a form of terrorism, of course. I will just give you an example. Uh, in one village uh, in Congo, this village is called Kavumu, um, the army, one army group started to rape children under five years. And uh, the way that uh, all these children were raped was to take them in their 
in their house, bring them in the bush, rape them, and bring back the children in their house. But when you rape a child of one year, you are adult. It means that you destroy her completely. The vagina, the rectum, and the bladder. And you just bring this child back to show the parents, to show the community what kind of injury is that you just did on the child. I think that it's a way not only to traumatize the child, but also to traumatize all the family, the parents. And I think that if you can see rape in this case, it's, it's really, it's a terrorism. To rape a woman in front of the husband, the children, and after to rape her, to destroy her, to shoot on her in front of the family. It's a terrorism because why you are doing this? It's just to create a terror so the population can be afraid, the population can respect you. You can use even the population as slaves. So I think that rape as a weapon of war can be used in different ways, but for me, it's a form of terrorism. Um. I was going to go on and talk about this, but again, I want to connect it to what you're saying now. Um, you gave a speech in 2012 at the UN, and in that speech, you condemned the Congolese government for not doing enough to prevent these rapes. And uh, less than a month later, an assassination attempt was made on your life. Um, your two daughters were kidnapped, and your bodyguard was shot and he died. Um, I can't imagine what it's like to speak about this at all, let alone in front of an enormous room of people. Um, so, you know, I would only ask if you feel comfortable to talk a little bit about that part of your story. But specifically, I would ask, you know, how do you find the courage and the strength in the face of all of this to just keep going? You've just... It's remarkable to me that even after this attempt on your life, um, you decided to go back to the DRC. You decided to return to Pansy Hospital and to continue doing this work. And I'm just astounded by that. Could you talk a little bit about what, <laughs> what, what gave you the strength to make decisions like this and, and to be able to do this awe-inspiring work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, I have to look for my, my answer because... <clears throat> Yeah, uh, maybe when we are talking about rape as a weapon of war, I want maybe to come back a little bit on rape as a weapon of war. I think that working with women for many years and uh, just see how women uh, in a strategy of war to destroy women in different ways, and um, when rape is used as a weapon of war, it means that there is a, it, the, the, they are using a kind of method where really you can see that is to destroy, not physically, but also mentally. It's also massive because one village can be, you can find an entire village, women of an entire village um, are raped in one night and is not taking care of age, uh, so it's systematic. And in this case where really women are, they are going through torture, coming at the hospital in the condition that I'm receiving them. Most of the time, 
I have an impression that they will never stand up again. I have an impression that they are destroyed forever. And when you are treating, you have just an impression that you are doing what you have to do, but what will be the impact on them? So, but let me tell you that I was so surprised to see that when women wake up, they don't wake up for themselves. Even if they come unconscious in the hospital, or even if we make an operation under anesthesia, when they wake up, the first question is, how are my children? How is my family? Where is my husband? And for me, this is really to think about others when you are suffering and people around you have the impression that there is no hope for you, but you're still thinking about others. This is really something that touched me a lot when it comes to women and their attitude. Because I'm treating also men, and I can see that when a man, after to be shot or something bad happened to him, to be operated, for example, the question is, what is my future? <laughs> what will be the, the future of my hands? <laughs> I'll be able to walk again. And I think that you can see that with these two different ways of the approach of the life, for me, is really special. And what I'm trying to do is really very, very small if I can compare for what women are doing for all of us. We have just to think about it. And for me, I think that to go on doing what I'm doing, I have just an impression that what women are doing is a lot. And if I can just bring my small contribution, it's just a small contribution. But what women are doing is really great, great. And I admire them, I support them, and I can do even more, but I know that I'm so limited to, to help them. But women in each circumstance they are thinking a lot about others and not only about themselves. And this is something who is just pushing me to go, to move forward. take a, whew, a small moment. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to, <laughs> just for a minute so I can catch my breath, um, ask you, I mean, I've spent the last seven days with you and you are relentless in your activism and I mean, a whole room will just stop and listen to you speak because you, you speak in a way that's so concise and honest and um, and also you're so egoless and um, results you know you really you know exactly what it is that you want and you you have such a clear picture but this is just a small part of what you do when you go home you'll you'll be you'll be working as a doctor all day and I'm curious what what does a typical day look like for Denny in the DRC? Will you, will you walk me through a, a typical day in, in your life, in your, in your home? Yeah. Uh, normally, uh, the days are not the same because uh, I have two days per, per week when I'm doing my clinic to receive patients and um, I can say that this is really the very hard days because to talk with people who come, they come with many questions and most of the time you don't have answer. And when you don't have answer, it's very hard. And uh, so I have two days where I'm doing my clinics. 
I have also two days where I'm working in the operating room to perform surgery. And I can say that for me, is maybe the more easier because there it's um, uh, what we say, uh, practical things. So you, you have a plan and, and you, you, you try just to accomplish it. It's, it's not like to talking with someone who is rejected by all, all the community, who is rejected by the husband, who is thinking about the children who were killed or things like that. It's, it's, it's more heavier too. But uh, I have two days of surgery and all the time I have impression that in the, in the operating room I'm, I'm more, I can more relax in walking even it's hard but it's more uh, relaxing for me. And uh, I'm using also uh, two days, one for my my staff, to talk with my staff, to discuss with my staff, uh, Wednesday. And uh, Saturday is a day that uh, I'm doing other activities, uh, especially um, things who don't relate with, with the hospital. And uh, every day I have time with my family. And this is really very important because when you, you, you can spend all the day with all big questions regarding the, the trauma, it's really very important to get yourself uh, people who can support you. And I can say that my family is supporting me a lot. Uh, I'm eating the morning and the evening, and on the table in the evening with my family is the time really uh, to do my own therapy. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so that's your form of self-care. Um, just as a human being, I often find when someone I know is going through something really difficult, uh, the fear of not knowing what to say when, when, they're, when they're going through it, or what can I offer in this moment, and I'm, I'm curious, you say that kind of that's one of the hardest things that you that you do is you is you spend time and you you listen and I'm just curious how you approach that when you don't have an answer or you don't know what to say to someone. Yeah, as as I said, really, it's uh, sometimes the hard moment because um, when you don't have an answer and you have someone who is in front of you crying without someone to support her. I have experience of girls who came uh, to my hospital after all their family to be killed. So they are alone and not alone with uh, all their capacity, but to be pregnant uh, at um, 12 or 14 years, it's with a big consequences on their, on their body. So when they come at the hospital, uh, it's like they already lose their um, childhood. And uh, now you have to explain to them that after to get a complication of just the childbirth, where they destroy ever since their bladder, the rectum, and the vagina. You have to explain to them that they will never get their femininity. This is something really terrible, to be in front of someone who is asking you the question about some things that you can't solve. And um, most of the time when I'm facing this kind of problem, I can say that it's the time that I'm losing even my capacity to sleep because you, you just have impression, what can I do? But you, don't, you know that you don't, you don't have solution. You can't, you can't solve the question. And there I think that the, it's still only one thing that you can do when you are in this kind of situation, is to give love. Because everyone, everyone need love. And I have seen how love can help girls who lose everything. They don't have a family. They, they lose 
or, or their femininity, but when they have love, you can see that their own life can change totally. It's, it's really, for me, very important to think that everyone can give something. If just you think about the, the person who is in front of you, and maybe you can't give him material, maybe you can't treat her surgically, but you still are able to give the love. Um, throughout the whole of your career, you have, you've championed um, girls, women's, survivors' voices. Um, and I'm curious, in terms of activism, what you think that movements like Me Too or me una menos, or time's up, or do you think that these movements are important? Do they play an important role on tackling gender-based violence, on destigmatizing sexual violence? Um, do, do they play a role? What, what do you think? Yeah, you know, uh, the rapists, they are using silence as a tool. And uh, when they are raping, they are creating a situation where women uh, can feel that it's their fault, where women can feel that if I talk about it, I will be humiliated again. So there is a kind of, to create a situation where women are forced to keep silence because they have to protect their family, they have to protect their children, and so on. So there is many reason to don't talk about it. But my big question, why? Why women have to protect the honor of the family? Why women have to protect the honor of the community and don't protect their own body? It's a big question. And I think that for to use rape in any circumstances, even in the peace time, silence is a tool to help a rapist to go on doing these atrocities on women because they know that women will not be able to talk about it because they want to protect, not themselves, because when women uh, is rape, they are suffering in themselves. So not to keep silence is not to protect themselves because they are suffering inside. So it's to protect others. And this protection is not only to protect the family and the, their society, but is also to protect the perpetrators. So it's very important for me for women to speak out and really talk about when it's happened, to break silence is really a strong weapon against rape in any case, in peace moment or in the war moment. And for me, all this movement is really something new. And it's a hope for me that we are on a path to fight against sexual violence. Because when we'll be able to shift the, the shame from women to perpetrators, then I think that all men before to rape have to think twice. But today, it's just to create a situation where women will feel guilty, even if she is victim, and this is protecting more perpetrators than victims. So I want just to tell to women here, speak out, be strong, 
just break the social norms and go ahead. It's not your fault. You have to understand that you are not, you, you, are, you don't need to feel guilty about what happened to you. Break silence. It's only the one way that I think men can take more responsibility. And for me, all this movement, I support them 100%. You're my hero. <laughs> you are my inspiration. You are my inspiration. <laughs> I'm just dreaming to see more youth in my country doing what you are doing. You are so impressive. I was going to ask you a question about commentators who say that the Me Too movement has gone too far, but I think perhaps I won't ask that question because <laughs> the answer seems obvious. Um, Eve Ensler is our, is our dear mutual friend. Uh, it was through her that we first met at the City of Joy premiere in New York. She calls you a beacon for all men to follow. And... Um, I'm curious, I think, that there are a lot of men in the world now that want to do something to help, that want to participate, uh, but sometimes that don't know what to say or, or how to do that. And I'm curious what advice you would have for men that want to be effective allies like you. When I think, when I, when I think of male feminist in my head, <laughs> You know, it's, it's you, and I, for men that want to show solidarity with us, uh, what advice would you give? Yeah, uh, I will ask uh, all the women in this room to applaud the men who are here. Sexual violence is not really a feminist question. It's not a question of women. It's a human question. And I think that most of the time, you can see that, uh, if you can see in the room, we, ha we have maybe 19% of women talking about this question. And I think that women did a lot. If you can see the last century, Women fight a lot to, to get the rights. And uh, even so, there is no a single country when we can say that equality is now there. Men and women are equal. And for me, it's really very important for women to understand that fighting against sexual violence, fighting for equality, men and women, is to fight also for our own rights. And this is very important because I think that women did a lot. Now I think that it's time for women, for men to stand up. It's time for men to change the behavior and just support what women are doing. We have a lot of examples where you can see that when you support women in the community, all the community is just moving forward and with the result. And this is not what Mkweg is saying. We have statistic on it. So why we have not used what we know that can help our society to be better? So men, we have to stand up and support women. Good. Since the days of colonialism, the DRC has often been stereotyped and stigmatized by Europeans. Um, and I want to read a quote from The Heart of Darkness um, by Joseph Conrad. 
In front of the first rank, along the river, three men plastered with bright red earth from head to foot, strutted to and fro restlessly. When we came abreast again, they faced the river, stamped their feet, nodded their horned heads, swayed their scarlet bodies. They shouted periodically together strings of amazing words that resembled no sounds of human language. And the deep murmurs of the crowd interrupted suddenly were like the responses of some satanic litany. I'm curious, you've borne witness to so much pain and suffering and brutality, and whether you feel the need to balance um, these stereotypical notions of the DRC with things that you love about your country, your beautiful, beautiful country, and things that you feel proud of. And how do you the balance that very real need to spread awareness of what's going on on the ground, but also kind of not play into these stereotypical uh, notions of, of what your, you know, your homeland is? Yeah, uh, really it's so sad, this stereotype on Congo. But uh, I would like just to say that we need really to make a difference between the people of Congo and the leaders of Congo. And it's so sad because since one century, the leaders that we got really don't care about the population. And this stereotype maybe came from, from this. If you, if you talk about, for example, um, the King Leopold uh, II, during the colonialism, he was really, the, the Congo was his property, and 10 million of Congolese were killed just for to get, to bloom the, the industry of car with the tire. This was terrible for Congolese people, and I think that to see the Congo, Congo and the Congolese in this group, you have to think about what happened and who is talking about the 10 million people who died at this moment, no one. After, I can say that today, we can see the kind of leaders that we have who don't care about the population. The population are starving. Children are dying with malnutrition in the country where it's raining nine months per year, where everyone can get food, but the bad governance mm. is just pushing to do really very bad things on, on the population. And for me, I think that the, the people of Congo are really a good people. And if you can see, especially women of Congo, they are strong. And uh, they care. But the big problem for Congo is the bad governance. And it is now for one century of really a bad governance who is pushing that we can get this terror tap on Congo. And this is so bad. So I'm dreaming one time maybe Congo will be different. And with a good governance, I'm sure that the population of Congo can do better things. Would you, would you share something that you love about your country? Something that you love about your home? Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, I don't know if you already visit Congo, but uh, uh, crossing the Congo from east to west and um, the nature, the biodiversity is really something that I appreciate a lot in Congo. 
you, you, you can see that we have good lakes, we have forests, we have good rivers, you, we have many kind of animals and, and so on. So Congo is really a paradise, but the big problem is that to don't have good mm. governance mm. is just changing everything. And uh, really, if you meet with women of Congo to see how they are singing, dancing, the beautiful in many colors, I, I, I can say that really this country needs really to get strong leaders who can just bring all these beautiful things to be seen in a good way and not mm. be a kind of stereotype, a stereotype of only bad things. Mm. Um, in preparing for this interview, uh, I, I didn't know this, but the DRC is one of the only places in the world that you can mine the specific mineral that we make our electronics with um, here in the West. And it, I wondered, I'm sure you're probably the right person to ask, what is safe to buy? What doesn't contribute to more conflict and bloodshed? Are there ways to be mindful about which electronics and which things to buy and not buy that, that doesn't contribute or make things worse? I think that the, the, the problem is not what you are buying, because I think that you have capacity really to do things better. Today the question uh, is about uh, the mobile telephone, and you can't get the telephone that you, all of us have. We can't get it without the contribution of Congo because uh, the telephone is using tantal, mm. and this metal is really needed, and it's a specific metal in the, in the mobile telephone. But I can say that the way that this mineral is, uh, is exploited is really the bad, the bad way. And uh, you know that the war of Congo is behind this war, the reason of this war, the why that uh, in this war they are using the body of women as a battlefield is really to push the population to leave their, their village uh, and, and create the area where there is no law, no faith, so they can exploit mineral in the condition that they can get it cheap uh, and put it on the international market very cheap. So I think what really we can think about this is how we can control that uh, we can get this mineral is, uh, in our mobile telephone, in our laptop, in all our electronic gadget without killing, raping, destroying children, using children as slaves, in mines. And I think that we need really to get um, this mineral to be exploited and, and get uh, um, legally binding treaties who can really support that uh, we have to control all, all the, uh, the chain of production of these minerals. This is what we are lacking today, to get a transparency in its exploitation and the use of these minerals. Mm -hmm. And this is very sad because the world don't want really to get this chain to be controlled. Of mm -hmm. course, there is um, some good direction. We can talk about the Frank Dodd Law who um, in the US uh, where really they can do a control, but the control is at the end of the chain, right. but not um, beginning. Uh, uh, on, 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 the, on the ground at where they are digging this mine. Right. And the European Union also have a law. This law will uh, be in vigor uh, on the 20, uh, 2021st. But th this law also is really not enough strong mm. to push company to do right things. But what I can really ask you all of you, you have the capacity to use your voice. You have the capacity to raise your voice against the use of children as slaves in the mine, to use rape as a weapon of war in Congo just for to get this mineral 
uh, cheap. There is a way to exploit it in a transparency way. And I think that if you raise your voice, I'm sure that your leaders can listen to you and make this big difference that uh, Congolese people are waiting for. We need you, and we need your voice. So as activists and consumers, we can use our voice to ask for stronger legislation for, sure. yeah, around this, around this technology, which is and making huge sums of money and... Exactly. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm sure that if you can use really your voice, it's, it's only the one way that I think things can happen in a good way because in all this region, we don't have companies who are exploiting, for example, dental. We don't have companies, so right. it's more easier to use, to use children mm. uh, as slaves in minds. But I think that for our conscience and ethic and moral, how can we accept that children be used in this way? How can we accept that women can be raped just and use rape as a weapon of war uh, in, in, the, in the area where this mine exists? so the soldiers can exploit it and get it on the international market. I think that, really, your voice can make a big difference. Uh, I recently read um, this quote from you that really resonated with me. Uh, you said that taking action means saying no to indifference. If there is a war to be waged, it is the war against the indifference which is eating away at our societies. Um, I just thought that that was so well put. And I suppose echoing my last question again, specifically around the issue of sexual violence, what can we do in this room uh, to kind of, yeah, to combat our indifference and, and take some form of action or show some sort of form of solidarity or what would, what would you suggest? Yeah, uh, really, I think that uh, if you can see our, the history of our humanity, you can see that all the time when the humanity decide to be indifferent, the consequences were, uh, were very huge on our humanity. And uh, for me, indifference is one of the worst attitudes that the human can get. And uh, talking about indifference, I think that we have just to feel that uh, what can I do for another? How can I support another? And the answer is, for me, clear. If you want people to do something for you, you have to think that I would like to do the same for them. And this is a way to combat indifference. Because sometimes we have the impression that, okay, this can be good for, for him. This can be good for this country or these people. It's a way just to escape our responsibility as human. But I think that as human, Every time when someone, some place, some people are in struggle, the big question is me as a human, sharing the same humanity as these people or this uh, place. What can I do to change their suffering? And this for me is very important in the life because when we don't think like that, we can just let things happen. And at the end, we have all these terrible consequences that I, want to, I don't want to come back on it. But you know that every time, indifference is a way to destroy our common humanity. And uh, what is happening when it comes to sexual violence, especially, I think that everyone can do something to fight against sexual violence. We can't be indifferent when we know how women who went through rape are suffering. Mm -hmm. And this is not something very far. Because when you are talking about rape in conflict, for example, 
In Europe, people have impression that, oh, it's happening in Africa. It's something really far off us, and uh, it's, it's a culture. Even I heard people talking about culture. But this is very wrong to talk about culture, about when, when it comes to rape. Yeah. And I used just to say, uh, in Yugoslavia, it's in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's happening in Syria, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I was in South Korea. Rape happened with the Japanese army. And when I hear women of 19, 19 years old mm -hmm. talking about what happened for them 70 years ago, mm -hmm. it was the same language as the language used by mm -hmm. girls I'm treating at Pansy 70 years after. And it's the same in Amer uh, Latin America. So I think that rape is really a question that we, could, we should not be indifferent because we are all concerned about this question. Mm. And everyone can really think what he can do to make things happen. I'm a surgeon, I'm doing what I can do. Today I'm activist to bring more awareness on this question. And I know that yourself you are doing a lot and I would like really if you can address some more to, I see in the room we have many young people. Well, how do you think that we can really help others Gosh, to well, fight <laughs> against sexual violence and be really active? I would echo what you've said, which is that it's very easy to think that this is something that's just happening in a far distant, far flung corner of the world that we will never visit or see um, in communities that we aren't part of. But like the most common UN statistic is that I see that this room is mostly full of young women, um, which will mean that almost a third of the people in this room will experience some form of violence, sexual or otherwise, in their lifetime. That's the whole of the section of this room. It's massive. Um, this isn't uh, an issue that will not touch us. It, it's going to at some point or another, which is awful. Um, I think there's a sort of strange acceptance as women that not feeling safe, not being completely safe in our societies and in our communities is just a fact of life and is something that we have to accept. That's the way of the world. It's dangerous to be a woman. But I don't think that we do have to accept that. And I do think that there are other ways that we could live and be. And beyond that, I think we deserve it. We have to demand it. We have to believe that it's possible. We have to believe in that world. It can't be a utopia. Um, I suppose that's what I'd say. Um, Good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, by the way, Pansy, the hospital that Denny works at is clearly does so much, um, so much more than just so much more than just a hospital. It's it's a symbol, um, truly. And uh, if you want to support Dennis's foundation and the hospital, then then that is something that you can also do. I have some audience questions. If you'd be up for that, um, Divyashri, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, wherever you are, um, wants to know what lessons from history help you to understand the present day? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I was reading what happened in 1930 around 1930. And I have impression that when you can see the, the media today, 
you have impression that we are not thinking a lot about what is happening around us, but you can see that head is just growing up, and you have impression that people are talking about things regarding hate as its normal things. And people don't really, they don't feel ashamed to talk about minorities. And I'm so afraid that uh, we really don't learn a, uh, enough for what happened in the history. And you have impression that you are in a normal time. But I think that we should be aware about what is happening now. People are talking about racism, talking about other people, uh, just building wall in spite to, to build bridges. And I think that this is very dangerous. And I can just make the comparison, and this is a, le a lesson for me for the, the history, that we should think a little bit more about what is happening today and be really clever that we don't repeat the same mistakes. Uh, the next two questions were questions that were asked by a number of different guests, the same questions a few times, so I will read, read those now. Um, is a full psychological recovery from rape ever possible? What techniques can help mitigate against the sense of guilt and shame that many rape victims feel? Yeah. I think that this question is really a crucial question because um, I don't see and think that after to be traumatized, after rape, most women who are coming at our hospital are living in with the syndrome of dissociation. So it's like their life and the spirit, their, their body and the spirit are completely dissociated. And we can do our best to try to bring this symptom, to bring the spirit in the body. But uh, my impression is that it's so hard to say that women can get a healing and forget what happened. So the life of all women that I, uh, uh, I met is the same. They can change their way of life to be more activists, to fight for the right of others, but all these things is completely different of their life before to be raped. So I can say that even if you have many techniques, in, in Congo now we are trying to use the musical therapy and see how this can support. We have art therapy, we have many things that we are doing to try to see how we can support women. And we can say that women are really becoming very strong and fighting for their rights and so on. But you can see in the attitude is that when someone rapes you, deny your humanity, put you in a condition that you, you, are, you have this feeling that you are, not, you are not a human at all, it's very hard to become normal. You can just change your way to get a positive way to live, but you can't really say that it's already finished in my life. So I think that we have many techniques, but it can just transform maybe the pain in power, but not to change completely uh, the life when it's happening, the life of a woman. I want to ask one more question before we have to conclude, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, who, has, who has inspired you? Is there a particular mentor that you've had? Is there a particular um, inspirational figure that you've 
carried around with you as you've done this, this work? No, I, I don't know. I, I have just to say my mother. <laughs> Danny, you're killing me. She's my mentor. She's your mentor. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I don't know how to thank you for giving up your limited time to be here and have this conversation with us. I don't know how to thank you for being so inspiring and... <laughs> Just yeah. thank you so much for being here and, and doing this with me and, and everyone who's in this room. We are, we are indebted to you. We are all inspired by you. We thank you. We, we deeply thank you. I want really to thank you for what you are doing. I know how you are committed for women around the world and what you are doing is so inspiring. And I hope that if really you can bring more um, uh, young women as you uh, to fight for the right of others as you are doing, I think that you can make really a big change of our world. And I hope that maybe one day you will come in Congo and just talk to women of Congo. I think that this will make a big difference for us. Thank you a lot for what you are doing. Thank you.